Welcome to the podcast today where we celebrate innovation for a happy planet. I am your host, Abigail Carroll. Did you know that about 490,000 metric tons of radioactive spent fuel is temporarily stored around the world in pools and dry casks above ground? No spent nuclear fuel anywhere in the world has been placed in a permanent repository. And one in three people live within 50 miles of a nuclear storage site. This week's guest is Elizabeth Muller. She is co-founder of a company called Deep Isolation that is tackling this waste storage problem, trying to make nuclear power truly safe and green. Liz's experience in France, where she was awed by the well-working nuclear power program there and its lack of carbon emissions, inspired her. When she returned to the United States, she wanted to see the U.S. grow its nuclear power footprint, but not before solving the nuclear waste problem. So with the help of her physicist father, that is what she set out to do. I must say, I particularly enjoyed this conversation because having been at a boarding school in France during the 1987 meltdown of the nuclear reactor at Chernobyl, as radiation wafted across Europe, I have been reluctant to support nuclear, despite its lack of carbon emissions. The lack of a solution for the waste has always been my defense. As such, this conversation challenged many of my core beliefs. Wherever you stand on the nuclear power debate, I think you will find this story compelling. It certainly gave me a lot to think about. And if deep isolation works, they will be a unicorn many times over. But let's hear it from Liz. Welcome to the podcast, Liz. Thank you so much, Abigail. Really happy to be here. So you are in the nuclear waste business, and there are some pretty riveting statistics on your website about nuclear waste today. Can you set up the lay of the land for us? Um, thank you. I think the probably the most important statistic, I mean, the, there's is that nobody today has ever successfully disposed of high-level nuclear waste or spent nuclear fuel. So, which is not to say it's unsafe where it is right now, it's in temporary storage, but it is an unsolved problem. And it's in temporary storage at a hundred different locations around the United States and hundreds of locations around the world, waiting for someone to be able to figure out how to dispose of it and then to actually put it into disposal. How do we get there? I mean, it's just, it's a, it's, it is kind of a crazy thought to think that we, we pushed a technology so far without really knowing how to deal with the byproduct. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, I think you know back in the early days, people assumed that we would figure out nuclear waste disposal. It was not it was not an assumption that it was going to take 50 years to figure it out. And so, you know, without criticizing the early innovators in in the nuclear space, I think the issue is really how is it that here we are 50, 60 years later and we still haven't figured it out. Yeah. And I think part of that is that nuclear waste disposal, as it has always been imagined, is actually really, really difficult. And it's difficult to do and it's difficult to do right. And part of the problem is that this has always been seen as a government problem. So we don't need private sector innovation. The government's going to figure out how to do. They will take care of us. And I think what what we've learned is that that's not really the best way to get something done. Um, And the approach that governments around the world have been using or been planning on using is very, very expensive and it's very unpopular and it involves picking a location and then transporting nuclear waste from all around the country or even the world to get to this particular location. And then the convincing the people who live near that location that they should want to be hosting a nuclear waste disposal facility. None of that is easy. And what what we're doing, so what Deep Isolation is doing, is by bringing in innovation and some new methods for doing safe nuclear waste disposal, we can make make it a much lower barrier. So an easier, easier to do, easier to accept, many possible locations where this where this can happen, and a more flexible and modular solution that that should be faster and simpler to, to implement. 
I mean, time, it occurs to me that time is of the essence here. If we've had nuclear waste sitting in this sort of midterm housing or situation for some 50 years, what is the shelf life of that? So it's typically 20 years renewable. So it depends on on the location where it is. So nuclear waste, when it comes out of the reactor or spent nuclear fuel, when it comes out of the reactor, it typically goes into a cooling pool. And it can stay in that cooling pool for, for a really long time. There's no real limit on, on how long it can stay there. But eventually the pools fill up. And, and then what are you going to do? And so as the pools have filled up, They've started to say, okay, well, we need some other place to to put this because new fuel keeps coming out of the reactor and they need to put that into the pools. And so that's when this dry cask storage comes into play. And so they take the fuel, the the spent fuel out of the pools and they put it into above ground temporary storage. And these casks are really big and they are safe and they're typically licensed for 20 years potentially renewable. So you can do it for 20 years. You can then do it maybe 40 years, 60 years, possibly even 100 years. But they will degrade eventually over time, and they're not considered a safe solution for very long time frames. So nuclear waste is potentially dangerous for hundreds to thousands and even millions of years. And these above ground temporary storage containers are not meant to be safe for those very long time frames. So yeah. eventually, and there is consensus on where it needs to go for the very long time frames, it does need to go very deep underground. Um, yeah. And that's when you move from storage, temporary storage to, to disposal. Yeah. Yep. So your company's name, out of no coincidence, is called Deep (laughs) Isolation. So tell us about your solution. So our solution is is taking the consensus, which is it needs to go into what's called deep geologic isolation, so very deep underground. And we're simply changing how you get it there. So the vision that people have been thinking about for the past 50 years is a mined repository. So if you want to get it down deep underground, how do you get it deep underground? And when you go back 50 years, well, what people did underground was they mined. And so the idea was you mine out a a space underground, typically 300 to maybe 500 meters in depth. Um, And then you have, you know, people down there, you know, getting rid of the rock and then eventually bringing in the waste for disposal in in the mine. That would work. So 300 to 500 meters is deep enough to meet the safety requirements of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission or the equivalent international body. But as I mentioned earlier, it's very expensive. It's hard to find a location that's that's happy with this. There's not all the locations are good enough. You have to be very careful in your assessment of the rock type. And yeah. that's challenging. And how do you really know with that the rock type is going to be the same on this edge of the cavern as it is on this edge of the, the, the cavern? So there's a lot of things that go into that. What deep isolation is doing is we're basically taking out the humans. So these days, you can go much deeper. You don't have to limit yourself to 300 to 500 meters using directional drilling. So technology that comes out of the oil and gas industry, um, it's very commonplace to go one, three, five kilometers underground. Um, The holes are smaller, so you wouldn't be able to fit a person in there, let alone a truck. But nuclear waste is very compact. It's one of the really remarkable things about nuclear waste is how compact it is. And if you use nothing but nuclear power for your entire lifetime, all of your waste would fit in size one small soda can. So that's wow. something that you can take advantage of when you use directional drilling. So we're looking at typical holes would be about 18 inches in diameter, which is wide enough to hold a, an intact spent fuel assembly without modifying it, without repackaging it. And we put those down into boreholes that would be one to three kilometers deep. Horizontal boreholes give you additional space at any given depth. So if you have a lot of volume, then we would probably use horizontal holes. If it's a small volume, you can just do a vertical hole or even just one hole. And then because you're deeper, it's significantly less chance that it could migrate out through the rock. So you're less dependent on things like engineered barriers, um, and you can create a very safe solution for the very long term. What about earthquakes and things like that? Is that, would that be disruptive? 
Yeah, earthquakes are a problem, particularly on the surface. So if you're on yeah. the surface and you have shaking and, and, and you know, heaven forbid, something cracks and falls apart, um, that's not good. It could potentially leak down into the water table. When you're very deep, um, the so we, we've looked at the worst case scenario we could think of in which there's a, a fault that directly ruptures one of our canisters and creates a, fa a fast path that goes all the way up to the surface. Um, mm -hmm. We've also added a heat gradient, so something that actually pushes the, the waste towards the surface and, and sort of modeled that out. How bad can it be? But again, when you're at one to three kilometers of depth, the answer is it's really not a problem because nothing's going to be able to migrate out through that rock over time frames that are impactful, you know, even over 1.5 million years. Yep. And there would would there be any, you know, with the fracking, we were having little earthquakes in the Midwest, would would this sort of technology provoke those same sort of seismic activities that may or may not be a problem for the the actual waste, but may just be a, an inconvenience of smaller, or bigger proportion yeah. on land. I mean, the reason that the oil and gas industry fracks the rock is that they want to break it apart to extract the oil and gas from the surrounding rock. That's not something we want to do. So we want yeah. to leave the rock as intact as we possibly can because that is our protective barrier. Yeah. So there's no fracking involved, just drilling, you know, which is the first part of what an oil and gas well would do before they get to the fracking part, but we, we wouldn't want to disturb the rock. So we're hearing a lot about small nuclear reactors. And, and are, I mean, it seems like their position to, to expand, how is this going to affect the amount of nuclear waste we have? And how are you positioning yourself with respect to that? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start from my personal perspective, which is that I am very concerned about climate change and, and global warming. And I think that we need to be doing more. I, you know, I love renewables. I'm a big fan of solar power, wind power, batteries, all of that stuff. And I believe we need to move really quickly if we're going to have much of a hope of staving off the worst of, of global warming. So I believe we need all we can get, and I believe that includes nuclear power, the safe use of nuclear power with a nuclear waste disposal solution. And so I'd like to think that if we can solve for nuclear waste disposal, that would enable us to move with small modular reactors, advanced reactors, and other type, uh, types of nuclear power, which can be very, very safe. And if we can dispose of the waste, then it feels like we're being responsible in, in the use of nuclear power. So it will generate more waste. You know, new nuclear power and expansion of new nuclear power will mean that there is an increased need for waste disposal. Um, it will also depend on the uh, reprocessing and recycling of, of waste. So some of the advanced reactor companies are talking about reusing existing spent nuclear fuel, which they can do. Hmm. So that can potentially reduce the volume that needs to go into disposal, but it won't change the fact that waste still needs to go into disposal. Before when we were talking about your coming on the show, you mentioned that you, your living in France had really inspired you to consider the nuclear power as a as a as a cleaner resource. And it's funny because my experience in France had led me to the opposite conclusion because <laughs> I'd been there during the Chernobyl blow, and you know I was in a boarding school in France, and the news said basically there was a curtain that came along the French border, and nobody in France yeah. was going to be affected at all. And I must say that that tainted my view of nuclear power. How do you think we've come in terms of just general safety? in nuclear power since that Chernobyl event? Yeah, I think the, the I mean, the, the current generation of nuclear reactors are very, very safe. And if you look at independent analysis of sort of impact of nuclear power, deaths and injuries from nuclear power, it's comparable with solar and wind. 
and and right. much much lower than for coal or even for for yeah. natural gas. So yeah. the 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 statistics are there, the numbers are there, the data is there. Nuclear today is extremely safe. Now that doesn't yeah. mean that this was always the case, right? I mean there there are certain old reactors that would not meet today's safety standards. Um, yeah. But modern reactors that are built in the West, I think we can feel really, really good about. Um, the n- new generation of reactors, so, that, so that's sort of conventional nuclear power, but the new generation is, is even safer. I mean, it's sort of silly to say even safer than what's already really, really, really safe. Um, but it's uh, intrinsic. So, so things that would just sh- shut off automatically with any, without any involvement of, of, of people or, or anyone just because of the physics. Um, yeah. And I think that's pretty exciting as well. Yeah. But is it, is it, does it leave a country vulnerable to could a, could a rogue state implode a nuclear facility and just use your own electric source or energy source against you in that way? Is that is that a real concern? Do you think, or is that just my own anxiety? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, these days, nuclear facilities, at least in the U.S., are rated that they're still very safe, even if an airplane crashes into them, right? And that's sort wow. of a requirement that that they have to meet. Then you ask the question, well, is that too safe? I mean, is that is that overboard, right? And I think what we really should be doing is having, I mean, this is you know, an academic exercise, but a levelized safety of energy sources, right? And, you know, we want to make sure that that nuclear um, nuclear needs to meet very stringent safety standards. And, and that's right. Um, but if you're not using nuclear power, what are you going to be using? And unfortunately, the replacement for nuclear is not typically solar and wind as much as we might wish it to be. And, you know, we've seen this right. in New York recently where they turned off one of their nuclear power plants and everyone expected them to switch to solar and wind and they didn't. And they're using more natural gas and their emissions are going up. So as much as yeah. we might like to think that, you know, replace nuclear with solar and wind, it's not happening. It's not happening in Germany either. Same thing. They, they wanted to move to 100, renew, 100% renewables, but they're using more coal, more coal and nat- yeah. natural gas. And you look at the safety record for coal, coal in particular, it's, it's horrible, right? Yeah. I mean, air pollution kills so many people. Um, and, and so nuclear, I think is, I mean, it's 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 not a question of I think nuclear is much safer than than coal, and you know natural gas is pretty safe in terms of deaths. But then you have the emissions and global warming, and if you want to avoid that, then you need a source of energy that doesn't cause environmental pollution and and global warming. So, can you imagine how how small can these little nuclear reactors go could we have one in a neighborhood or are they these just going to be you know much greater scale like a regional nuclear reactor like what's the forecast yeah. here i mean the the forecast is interesting i think i think it depends i think it's going to depend a lot on cost too so yeah. what we're seeing today is that the small modular reactors tend to be more cost effective when they're not that small. And the smallest ones are really great when there's a place that's not connected to the grid or when it has a a, a specific need and and therefore can afford to pay a little bit more. But in in many use cases, um, bigger is still less expensive. Now that could change, right? I think there are um, ideas and innovations and the amount of work and creativity that's happening in in the space right now is really exciting. So we might get to the point eventually where you could have a nuclear reactor that's powering your house or your car yeah. or or something. But we're not there yet and yeah. you know I'm not I'm not able to make a prediction as to whether or when that might happen. You mentioned transportation and as we grow these nuclear plants, uh, these reactors, the number of them around Moving the waste to one of these deep drilled holes is going to present a challenge. Is there an advantage to building the reactors close to the holes? Is that a strategy or how how are you guys envisioning dealing with that? Yeah. So what we're seeing, and we're seeing more of this in in Europe right now than than in the U.S., but a little bit of it in the U.S. too, is that when people are thinking about building new nuclear power plants, they are thinking about the waste already. 
So it's okay. no longer this, I'm going to build a nuclear power plant and someone someday will take my waste and I don't need to worry about the waste. Um, people yeah. are being responsible and they're demanding yeah. that the nuclear operator think about this too. And um, so what we're seeing in Europe is a lot of interest in building new nuclear power that is co-located with a borehole for disposal. So the community knows what it's getting from day one. So they are buying a nuclear reactor. They are buying um, you know, the, the source of electricity, heat, whatever it is that, that, that they're getting. Um, and they know um, what's going to happen with the waste. It's going to come out of the reactor and it's going to go into temporary storage if need be for a little while. And then it's going to go into the borehole facility that has already been approved and licensed and agreed on by the community. Um, that's really, I mean, a fantastic way of doing it. Um, in the United States, the approach has been, so the, the rule that is still on the book, according to the Nuclear Waste Policy Act and, and its amendments, um, is that the U.S. government is going to take all of the nuclear waste um, and they are going to move it to Yucca Mountain, which is in Nevada, and they are going to start doing this by 1998. Appropriately named. <laughs> um, and of course, you, you know, 1998 came and went and this never happened and the waste was never collected. Yeah. And the waste is still at the sites where it was generated um, at the nuclear power plants. Um, and Yucca Mountain has been canceled. So it's yeah. not funded. There is very, very few people today expect that Yucca Mountain will ever be built. But it is officially still the U.S. Uh, policy, the U.S. law of the land, um, is that waste is going to go to Yucca Mountain. That does require a lot of transportation. So in order to get it to Yucca Mountain in Nevada, um, it has to be transported from California, from New York, from Michigan, from Texas, mm -hmm. from, from all over the country. Um, that's not a technical challenge. Transportation of nuclear waste can be done very safely, but it is a concern for many people who don't want nuclear waste traveling on their roads or going through their backyards. Um, it's also a very significant expense. So um, what mm. the, you know, the Europeans are thinking about, this co-location of a borehole facility together yeah. with the nuclear reactor, makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you, could, if you can keep the nuclear waste off the roads, if you can dispose of it safely near where it is right now, um, I think many people find that a more attractive solution. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. I'd like to thank Gulf of Maine Research Institute and Bold Ocean Ventures for their support of Happy Planet Podcast. GMRI and Bold Ocean Ventures have partnered to create a mission-driven venture capital fund supporting the growth of innovative, sustainable, ocean-related businesses. Listeners may remember Patrick Breeding, who was on our show last year to talk about Marin Skin Care and its clinically proven formula that uses glycoproteins from Maine lobsters to treat eczema and dry, damaged skin. This company has since become wildly successful with their lobster lotion, and Patrick is inviting listeners to a 20% discount on their products by using the coupon code HAPPYPLANET on their website, Marin Skin Care. I actually use this product myself, and I highly recommend it. For a blue economy to thrive, people need to use more sustainable products. But which products? And will consumers actually adopt them? Innovators like you are hustling to figure this out. Spark number nine can tell you if there's demand for your product. Spark markets your product before it's built using online advertising so you launch smarter. Have a big idea? Vet it with Spark before you build. Visit Spark online at www.sparkno9.com or find them on LinkedIn. Hey, and I want to give a quick shout out to all of the Blue Economy folks out there. Do not miss the Oceanovation Festival on June 19th and 20th in The Hague, Netherlands. Join over 450 global innovators, investors, and experts transforming the blue economy for a healthier ocean. For more information, visit their website, oceanovation.live. Welcome back to the podcast. So you've got this solution and we have all this backlog of waste and yet, and you've been around since I think 2018. What's stopping this? What's, what's, what's the problem? 
Yeah. So we've done some test holes. We just haven't done yeah. an actual disposal right. hole. And yeah. I think the the difficulty is that um, governments, the governments who are our customers for this work, yeah. think about nuclear waste disposal in 50 to 100 year timeframes. So yeah. that is now colliding with an urgency that is new. So right. the idea of um, you know, solving nuclear waste before we build more nuclear power, um, that as a concept is really only a couple years old. And so we're getting <laughs> new people in, yeah, we're getting new people in government who care about climate yeah. change, who care about, um, you know, who want to be able to build new reactors and who recognize that it's important to figure out nuclear waste disposal ahead of time. Um, so, so we're now having the sort of the the people who have been thinking about nuclear waste for for a long time, maybe their whole careers, and they think that sometime in the next fifty years they'll have a plan to eventually dispose of the waste. That's sort of what they're yeah. working towards. And then you have yeah. new people who are saying, "Well, why aren't we doing this right now? Let's let's not have a plan to make a plan. Let's just do it. Let's just do disposal." And and yeah. um, and there's, you know, that's an internal contradiction that we're getting within governments. Um, we are seeing that there's some urgency um, in some locations. So some countries feel more urgency about disposing of waste than others. Um, and those are the countries and the governments that I expect we're going to start with. So we yeah. will work with those. And um, once the waste has been disposed of, then I think we'll start to work with some of the others who are maybe a little bit slower in um, making yeah. up their minds. So you mentioned that there was a potential one in, in Eastern Europe, I believe. There, yeah, there's uh, a number of um, yeah. locations. So we, we've we've done a number of published studies. So many of these yeah. are available on the Deep Isolation website. Uh, governments that we've worked with already, where we've looked at how we would dispose of their waste in their particular rock type, given their particular inventory. Yeah. Um, and yeah, a lot of the work that we've done to date is in, in Eastern Europe. Yeah. And should you actually get to drill one of these holes and pack it with waste. What, what kind of financial opportunity is this for a company like yours? So the amount that uh, nuclear reactors, so, so a nuclear reactor expects to generate, and, and in many cases, a certain amount of waste. And in many cases, there has been a fund or an expected cost for the disposal yeah. of that waste. Yeah. In some cases, it's actually been money that's been put aside. So there's been a fee that's been associated with the generation of electricity. Yeah. On average, globally, that's about a billion dollars per reactor for the expected cost to dispose of the waste. Amazing. Now, we're Amazing. going to be cheaper than that. We're going to be significantly cheaper than that. But you're not going to have trouble becoming a unicorn. <laughs> right. Correct. Yes. We're going to have a stable of unicorns. <laughs> yes. I love it. I want to know a little bit about your background because you came at this really from climate as a climate activist. And I, I just think that's really interesting that a climate activist comes around to being really pro-nuclear. Um, yeah. So tell me, tell me about that. Yeah. So before co-founding Deep Isolation, I co-founded and was running Berkeley Earth. So this is an environmental nonprofit. It has fairly high prominence. It's regularly mentioned in the IPCC reports, New York Times, National Geographic, as one of the big data reports. So if you yeah. really want to understand what's happening with climate change and temperature, Berkeley Earth is, is really one of the best sources there is. And our data is freely available. So it's open source. It's available on the web in lots of different forms. And so we, we started by analyzing global warming. So the temperature record, is global yep. warming real? And this was back you know, 15 years ago when people were still questioning, is global warming real? And we found, yes, global warming is real. It's happening. We could rule out sunspots as being part of the cause. We were able to re rule out many of the other concerns people had around urban heat island effects and you know, data, data bi bias, you know, not using all of the data. And uh, so, yes, global warming is real. And, you know, after we did that work, I wanted to focus of, okay, global warming is real, but what are we going to do about it? 
And taking a similar approach of thinking about what are the data-based solutions. So not necessarily yeah. all the feel-good solutions, which may feel great, but may not have much of an impact when it comes to stopping climate change. What are the things that maybe don't feel so good necessarily, but will actually have an oversized impact? And yeah. uh, ended up nuclear waste disposal being one of those. I mean, it doesn't sound sexy. It's not something that, you know, feels like you're changing the world necessarily, but you can. I, if, if you can solve nuclear waste disposal and that enables the safe use of nuclear power, I think that's a huge enabler to allow us to, to fight climate change. Yeah, for sure. So what's so you are a few years out yet from from one of these big projects. Uh how does a company like yours exist for a decade? What's what's the model? Is it are you getting grants? I mean, you are doing fundamental research that has, you know, common good um mm. you know, attached to it. So how do, how does that work? Yeah, so we are investor funded. So in the early days, we we raised a significant amount of, of money that allowed us to tackle some really big ideas. Um, now we do have revenue. So we are we are making money and we are sustainable, you know, not able to perhaps invest as much in growth as we might yeah. like if we don't have investor funding. So we are still open to to investment so that we can grow faster and do this more. But we're also capable of living off of our revenue now, which is a huge okay. achievement. And, you know, it feels really good to, to be able to do that. Yeah. But that's the interim step where we want to be is sort of like you said, we want to be actually doing disposal work and mm-hmm. we're not there yet. So I do think yeah. that our first disposal contract is, I think we're about ready for it. I think yeah. we, we've we done the legwork. We've sort of shown that we can dispose of the waste very safely. And we've looked at locations and inventories and, and, and done all that prep work. So I think we're ready to win a disposal contract. And then when we win a disposal contract, that's when we're going to have to do the licensing work. So it is sort of, as you said, a year to two to three um, yeah. out from beginning the you know, the work of actually putting the waste underground. But in terms of, you know, a, a really important inflection point for our company, yeah. winning that disposal contract is is going to be huge. Interesting. This is sort of a personal question. You've started this company with your dad and you started your nonprofit with your dad as well. Tell yeah. me about that. So I grew up with a physicist as a father. And I, I'm not, you know, I, I liked math and I like physics. I majored in math, but I was always more inclined towards working with people and, and, you know, sort of big, less, less technical problems. Like I like the technical side. I have fun with it, but I want to, I want to, I want to do real things, not just research. And I moved to France as, as, as you mentioned, and I was living there and working on, new technologies. And I was working for the OECD for a number of years. Wow. And then I ended up doing some consulting work where we were looking at how governments can make use of technology to improve what they're doing as, as a government. And this was initially focused primarily on information technology, so the internet mm-hmm. and, 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 and all that stuff. But then it started going into the direction of energy and climate change. And I recognized that it would be really helpful to have a scientist, you know, a, a climate change expert as part of our team. And so I called up my dad and I said, hey, mm-hmm. you know, you've been teaching about climate change and ice ages and all this stuff for, for a really long time. Could we get you to do some consulting with us? And he said, of course, happy to do that. And he and I ended up doing some consulting together and having such a great time of it. Uh-huh. We worked together really well because he is a scientific mind and an inventor like, like I, you know, like nobody else. But I take care of the business and I have sort of the vision for how do you build an organization and a company that can really get things done. And so we're very complimentary. And so the first organization that we created was was Berkeley Earth, was the nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was so much fun and and it worked so well that we decided, well, let's just start our next company together, too. (laughs) And that was deep isolation. So we've been working together for, I guess, about 15 years now. And it's been fantastic. Oh, that's that's just a great story. So you you're open to raising money, but this is not a uh, you know you're you're making enough money to get by today. I mean, are, are you? Is it a formal raise or is it just sort of 
if the right person came in, it was sort of maybe strategic? Yeah, I think we're open to options. So I think, you know, for many reasons, we, in the early days of the company, we didn't fit your standard portfolio for venture capital. I think we fit it better now. So I think we are yeah. of interest now to to some VCs that we weren't of yeah. interest to before. But it's got to be a creatively minded entity because there is nothing yeah. like deep isolation out there. So it's not like we're one of a dozen companies and you pick the one you you like the most. Um, we're we're truly different and only company that's that's in the space. Your career has all been about climate change and staying ahead of it. Are you feeling optimistic today about the potential to stay ahead of climate change? That's a really big question. I think it depends on my mood. It depends on the day, right? Mm-hmm. I still think we can do this. I really think we can. I think that I think nuclear is a big part of it. I think transition, you know, finding solutions for the interim is also really important. And research on those longer term solutions is also really important. I think there's a lot of creative minds doing some really great work. And so, yes, I am very optimistic overall, but I also get frustrated when I see people doing things that, you know, it's it's expensive, it's hard to do, and it's not really going to move the needle much. So, yes, optimism generally, but mixed with some frustration along the line. Well, I think that's I think that's a good response. I think I think a lot of us are right there. Yeah. And finally, do you have any advice for young entrepreneurs today, other than you know wrangle your father into the business because that could be fun? Yeah, I think you have to enjoy it. I think you know some people think of entrepreneurship as sort of heads down and painful twenty four seven, and I think if that's the way you you treat starting a business, you're going to burn out really quickly and you're not going to have a lot of fun along the way. I mean, what I like the most about starting a business is the pace of learning. So when you're a small startup, when you're just you and your co-founders and the world is your oyster and nothing's been done before and you're doing it all yourself, right? That's a really special feeling. But when you've been around for six or seven years and now you're grappling with you know, big questions and contracts and, you know, team dynamics. And it's it's just a totally different set of, of challenges. And I think if you like that, I mean, if, you, if, you're, if you're open to that and you have to keep learning the whole time, because as soon as you become an expert in something, it's going to change, right? Your company is going to grow yeah. and your expertise on how to manage 10 people companies is no longer relevant. Yeah. And so I, I think for entrepreneurs, if you just you know, don't necessarily try and start a company in something that you're an expert in because you're not going to stay an expert in it and it's going to be changing constantly. So keep right. that sense of adventure and go into yeah. it, you know, because you're doing something important and, and because you can have some fun along the way. Well, that's great. Um, and hopefully you can do some good. And do some good. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I just want to thank you so much for for being here today, particularly given my my reluctance to embrace nuclear power, I really feel like I've learned a lot and it and it does give me a lot to chew on and and reconsider. So so thank you and I and I hope other um, listeners have a similar similar experience. Yeah. Well thank you so much, Abigail. It's really nice talking to you. And if any of your listeners would like to reach out, we you know, info at deepisolation.com. We're always open to ideas, thoughts, feedback, you know, concerns. We try to be really transparent in, in our work. Yeah. And so all of our technical papers are online. People can read them, comment on them. Um, and really we would welcome any thoughts and feedback that, that your listeners have. That's great. Thank you so much. I'll put your website and that that information in the show notes too. Amazing. Thank you so much. Well, I hope you found that interview as interesting as I did. Did it shape your views on nuclear? I'd love to hear your thoughts. If you're interested in learning more about Liz and her company, Deep Isolation, we have her information in our show notes. Thank you once again for listening. Please follow Happy Planet wherever you tune in and leave us a rating and review. It really does help new listeners discover the show. Happy Planet was reported and hosted by me, Abigail Carroll. I'm also the executive producer. George Brandel Egloff created our theme music. Learn more about my work and get in touch by visiting happyplanetpodcast.com.